Welcome to the Corlin Economics Report, a weekly look at financial and political topics relating to asset-based investing. Guests on this program pay no fees to appear, and guests and hosts disclose any equity interest in companies profiled. Now, the Corlin Economics Report. Hey, everyone. Welcome in to the weekend edition of the KE Report. This is going to be quite the weekend show as we can now talk about moving forward in the U.S. with President Trump elected. We are recording this first segment on Wednesday, and uh, it wasn't really as close of a battle as I think most people thought it would be as we can fairly confidently say that Trump is the president of the U.S., moving forward after this election. So now we can talk about what the policies could mean. And we're going to focus on the resource sector, starting off chatting with Joe Mazumdar, editor of Exploration Insights. I'll post a link to Exploration Insights in the show notes. Please click that and follow along with what Joe is covering in terms of individual companies. Now, Joe, as I said, look, let's look ahead to the positives and the negatives that Trump, it sounds like, will try to put forward when he is in office. And we're going to tie it all back into the precious metals and critical minerals. Joe, let's first start out of country here. Some of the moves that Trump might do to other countries break down what you are forecasting. And we will tie this again back into precious metals and critical minerals. Yeah, thanks for that. Like, I mean, it's not only that he won the presidency, and I I think probably good for the U.S. was that one person won it, whoever won it, but won it convincingly. And so there was no legal battle or anything like that. So, but not only did, did he win it, you know, convincingly, they also, his party kept the Senate, and it looks like they're going to keep the House of Representatives. So basically, and, and they've got, you know, the Supreme Court. So, I mean, I don't think there's been uh, another more powerful position by the Republican or Democratic Party in a long time, that they not only have the trifecta, but they also have the courts. So whatever they put out, there's a good chance that they will be able to pass it, you know, at least for two years until they have another round of elections for, you know, what they call the midterm elections. So in the interim... If we go on the positive side, like avoiding the politics of it uh, in terms of who wins, who loses, I would say, you know, you know, broad strokes that the the Democrats were good for demand for critical minerals because they were all about, you know, climate change and decarbonization and that. But they were not good for permitting local projects, mining projects. They were more about financing processing. But there was little connection between anything that they put in a letter of intent that they would give money to and whether the project would actually get permitted. With the Trump presidency, you know, the idea that they're going to slash regulations, which we saw a little bit of when he was president in terms of at least resolution mining, where they did the land swap and then Biden took the land swap away, that might come back. You know, we might see that road re-implemented for, you know, Trilogy, and that's probably why Trilogy's share price went up. So I can see, uh, you know, positive changes on regulations permitting for exploration, development, uh, and all that for mining in the U.S. under the Trump administration, uh, at least in the first two years before the midterm elections, unless there's a big change. But it seems like he's less about the demand side. So he's trying to potentially eliminate the electric vehicle subsidies and potentially and he, he's always about changing what the last president did. And so the IRA was a big deal for Biden. He probably wants to chip away at that one. And one of the big things there was the uh, subsidies allowed for uh, electric vehicles. So that might hinder demand. And then globally, the issue would be the tariffs on countries like China in terms of, you know, not only their electric vehicles, but all all their goods. So if that happens, that could hinder or have a negative impact on commodity consumption by the biggest consumer of commodities, China. So that's probably why we're seeing, you know, copper prices and things like that getting hit. And then on, on the other side, like in terms of Mexico, like where I just was a couple of weeks ago, was they were, you know, a big proponent of nearshoring, like, you know, hey, 
you're going to impose these tariffs on China. You don't want anything from China. You worry about your supply chain. You know, let's implement nearshoring. The nearshoring idea, I think, would have been better under the Democrats than they will be under the Republicans, because probably Trump will still impose tariffs on stuff coming from Mexico, as some people are worried that the Chinese and others might use Mexico as a front for bringing up stuff from uh, under the previously known NAFTA agreement. So there's a lot of things happening. And I, I think the other thing that he wants to do is weaken the U.S. dollar that might take you know, the impact off of the tariffs, off of goods and services. But the problem is that, you know, if the tariffs are inflationary, which they are, that might increase, you know, force higher interest rates, which would make the dollar stronger. So a lot of different things happening that we'll have to see how they play out. Well, Joe, let's also consider what it means for precious metals, just from the standpoint that Either party, I don't think it really mattered who won as far as they're going to spend more money. We know that. But there is that deficit issue in the U.S., which is typically good for the gold narrative. But like you say, a stronger dollar, typically bad. How do you see the tailwinds and headwinds playing out in the precious metal space? Hard to know which thematic people will go to. The automatic one would be the U.S. dollar, which would impact all commodities, including gold, negatively impact. But like you said, like maintaining tax cuts that he had before would increase the deficit, which would in the long term be positive for gold. But what we've also seen is, you know, the slashing of regulatory red tape would be positive for Bitcoin. And so there might be a little bit of Bitcoin, you know, eating gold's lunch for a little while. Yeah, look at the reaction on the back of the election results. Bitcoin shot up to 75,000 and gold dropped damn near $100. Now, of course, these are just short-term moves. But, Joe, let's take that a step further. The markets also think that Trump is going to be good for them. So if we see markets and Bitcoin doing well, does that further leave gold behind? Uh, Potentially, potentially, because there was probably more concern about geopolitical tensions But, I mean, you know, if we do the political part, I mean, like he's promising to end all these wars. I don't know what that means, but in terms of the Ukraine-Russia thing, I think that he will be not a a big positive for, you know, continuing funding that the Ukrainian effort. So that might force the Ukrainians uh, to make some kind of agreement with Russia, you know, In the end, I mean, he might just consider defunding NATO. He might do something radical like that. That would be very radical. Uh, I'm not saying that's what he would do, but he's not, he's obviously not pro-NATO. And on the other side, you know, would he be able to end the Israeli-Palestine conflict? I don't know. But I think his election was definitely more of a positive for Israel at this time. But all that geopolitical conflicts that... You know, it's not a long, it doesn't have a, it doesn't resonate with the gold price for a long time. Those sort of tensions, they tend to be ephemeral, but there's been so many tensions and they kept escalating. That was another reason that gold had done well. If he comes in and stop, starts de-escalating some of this stuff, which he could possibly do, uh, that, you know, that would, you know, decrease the global geopolitical t- tensions and maybe you know, be negative for gold. But Joe, another big focus on what these business policies could mean would be on the energy sector. And as you said, he's probably going to de-emphasize some of the clean energy and renewable side of things, which would be pushed harder by the Harris administration in favor of oil. But there's a lot of counterintuitive information out there. Like under the Biden administration, oil prices did a lot better than under Trump's regime last time. If he drills baby drill with the oil, that may lower oil prices. But what does it mean for something like silver? that's so dependent on solar power and the solar demand, could the focus shifting back to nat gas plants versus solar have an effect on the silver markets? Yeah, I don't know how much of the compression of the gold to silver ratio is linked to solar panels as opposed to people just being a little bit more fervent for the metal. I would say that, you know, that support from this from solar is a nice base for silver, but I would think that most of the acceleration of the silver price was more about 
trying to compress that multiple and people thinking that, okay, silver is the metal to have because gold is doing really well. Silver is lagging. You know, we need to buy silver because gold's doing very well. And if gold stops doing very well, then silver might come back, you know, somewhat. I, I don't think the, you know, the U.S. is not the only country that, you know, that has a big solar industry i think you know you know europe and other countries are using it so there's still demand outside of europe and 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 as we know that the ev penetration in the states hasn't been big anyway so you know reducing it it's not as if they were taking it reducing it from a uh, you know a big level you know that that ev demand is still in other countries like europe and china that's still going strong but i think trump just tapped into the market that you know, a lot of these people, you know, through the middle America, let's say, don't drive EVs. They think it's more like the West Coast and the East Coast, which they might not have a lot of affiliation to. And yeah, there's no infrastructure for them to bother having EV. EVs are too expensive because they won't let in cheaper <laughs> Chinese imports. So they're stuck with the more expensive Teslas and other vehicles, and there's no infrastructure to drive them. I think hybrids, would be the way to go still, but nobody seems to talk about those. <laughs> That's so true. But hey, we are seeing some companies focus at least a little bit more on some of those hybrids. Joe, because Trump was president starting back in 2016 for that four-year period, can we use any of that historical reference to see how especially precious metals or the precious metal stocks fared over that four-month period and compare it to what might happen now when he's back in? I don't know, because uh, I would say the Trump presidency, the first one, was more chaotic. I mean, I, we don't know what this one will look like, but... Yeah, watch your I, words, Joe. We don't know what we're in for. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we got to know that, you know, he was probably fighting the, the House of Representatives, which I believe at that point was still Democratic, and he couldn't pass a lot of things, and his administration, because that was the first time he was president, was obviously highly chaotic. You know... He's not known for being a hard worker, although, you know, he's stumped a lot for the last 60 days in terms of his speeches. But I think it's the people that he brings on that will dictate how some of his policies get executed. And that's important. But he's not going to have much opposition anymore. I mean, if they have the House of Representatives and they have the Senate and, and a lot of those people know that they got their seats because of him. There's not going to be a lot of people opposing what he does. And he's not going to be the policy wonk. He's not the guy who's going to be saying, this is how I want to do it. It'll be J.D. Vance. It'll be Elon Musk. It'll be all the guys behind him that'll be doing that. Well, Joe, let's bring copper back into the discussion again with the critical minerals. There's a lot of forces. Obviously, it's a global market and, the, and what happens with China and some of the tariffs will play into it. But with a de-emphasis on let's say EVs, that's a demand shrinkage, but then you still have the pro-business side of AI data centers and look at the response in cryptocurrencies, the crypto mining. Is there still a place for copper to have a good run despite the covailing forces in his administration? Yeah, as I said, I mean, the EV demand in the States wasn't really driving a lot of the EV market. The penetration even in California wasn't as high as they thought it would be. I think the growth is still in China. The growth is still in um, Europe and other places in the world. And I don't think it's ever been in the States. One key is the lack of infrastructure and, and the fact that people still love to drive uh, internal combustion engines. So I don't think that's a big deal. You know, it'll look like a big deal. I still see the problem from copper more being on the supply side than the demand side. And I don't think that changes with the Trump presidency. You know, maybe some of these projects get permitted where they weren't before. But the problem in the end is if we don't have any refining capacity, you know, in the West, though that copper concentrate, if it is a concentrate, has to go to Asia. And again, 50 percent of the capacity for refining is still in China. So that'll still be problematic. And so no matter if Trump's in the, or Harris is in the dynamics on the supply side for copper do not change. So considering that, but there could be maybe some more permits issued 
do you look more favorably on any of these U.S. projects, either copper or critical minerals, what have you? A anything U.S. focused that could have an easier permitting landscape, or is that kind of just one peg in a much bigger picture? I think permitting will be much easier because um, his whole mandate is to uh, deregulate. And so there's a lot of red tape. Uh, and, you know, the issues um, under the Biden administration where, you know, some projects were provided permits like the road permit for Trilogy South 32's Arctic project, I think is 211 miles that Ada was looking to get. They got the permit then after five years of advocating for it and thousands and thousands of pages of documentations and meetings. And then it was taken away because an NGO group came out of the woodwork. So I don't see that happening in under a Trump administration, which would be a positive for mining. And, and that might be that might offset some of the issues on the demand side with critical minerals. But because there, there are issues with the IRA Inflation Reduction Act on a state by state basis, because some states which are Republican led have had benefit from that. And I doubt if they'd wanted to take it away. So it won't it won't be like a global mandate. Uh, you know, in terms of every, this is what we're going to do. Every, every state will be different. And he likes to basically, you know, give, especially Republican governors, the ability to, you know, run their own states and do uh, do their own thing. Well, just along that topic, are there any states that you look at most favorably in the U.S. as far as for mining projects and permitting and social license? Are there states that you like to be in and states that you avoid? Oh, there's lots of states to avoid. And, and I don't think the federal government will change some state's opposition to mining. It's, it's a very local thing. But if there's a state and if there's a, you know, a group that approves a mining operation, but it's the federal government that's stopping it, that will be removed pretty easily, I think. So if the federal government is the problem with a project, I think that under a Trump administration, it would look more favorable in terms of the potential development or whatever they're trying to do. OK, Joe, let's talk more broad metals markets driving down into the stocks then, because October was a pretty good month, even for a lot of the juniors I noticed in the middle of the month, even trailing to the end of the month, juniors were getting attention, even without issuing any sort of news. We were seeing more financings in the market. It seemed like investors were getting much more excited about uh, precious metals. Precious metals were breaking out. Gold was consistently hitting all-time highs. Silver had broken above that 3250 level. But in the last couple of weeks, that interest has faded a little bit. What's your assessment of the overall health of the resource equity market, especially in terms of the juniors? Yeah, I would say that, you know, that break or pause that you're talking about was probably leading up to the election to know which side it would break. And nobody wanted to basically buy or sell or anything unless they had a great opinion on which way it was going to go. So you did have the Trump trade in terms of the equity markets. The equity markets seem to have reacted very positively to the Trump election. They've obviously hit a new 52-week high on the or record high on the S&P 500. Uh, I, w I would say going forward for juniors in critical minerals, you know, I, I would like to see how that plays out because we've been looking at critical minerals and saying, OK, well, these guys can get funded, you know, through the U.S., you know, different agencies to, you know, to shore up the critical mineral supply chain. You know, how is that going to work going forward? Are there, Is that funding going to still be available? Like, is Perpetua still going to get funded? You know, is that money going to go to them? Is that, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, I think what's committed is committed. But if it hasn't been committed, is there any risk to that going forward? That would be a question to me because that was in terms of development projects, one source of benefit from the uh, the Democrats in terms of being a source of funding. But at the same time, they were having a hard time getting permitted. So now it seems like the reverse, that they could get the permit, but they might have a hard time getting some of this funding. 
Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic on either side of it. It seems like it's difficult to get both at the same time for the mining industry. But I do want to bring M&A into the discussion, Joe. You track a lot of it in the silver space. We saw and Silvercrest taken out by First Majestic and Core Mining. And then in the gold side, we've seen Next Gold merge with Signal. We've seen Mineral Alamos take over Sabre Gold. And we saw Aura take over Bluestone in Guatemala. More M&A on both the silver and gold side. What are your thoughts on M&A? Well, I mean... M&A, is, I think the intermediates got to really think about where they're going to get their growth. And, you know, people have been leaning towards paying a premium on production and consolidating because that's what basically the industry wants. I'm, I'm interested in seeing if on Mexico, where I was a couple of weeks ago, I was at a mining conference in Sonora, which is a basically a mining state. And this is a conference that's, you know, well attended. Yeah, but it's more of a contractor sort of conference, you know, big shovels, drilling companies, that sort of thing. And, and I could make out just in a corner, there might have been five or six mining companies in that conference, you know, actually with booths, you know, so it was a very, I don't know, suppressed sort of a mining conference where very few operators were actually attending with sponsored booths. They might have been attending and walking around, but they uh, not a lot of them had sponsored booths. And the impression I got was, with the new government, it might still be problematic. But then the other issue is that they're really counting on this near shoring. And if the Trump government, you know, imposes tariffs on Mexico and and th- that might hinder near shoring, do they return to mining? I don't know. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work. But there was a lot of the problem with Mexico right now. is It's people who are in Mexico that are investing in Mexico. What we the issue is that we're not getting anybody from outside coming in for the M and A or building projects. I know that Tex Copper Strategy includes their fifty fifty joint venture with Agnico Eagle at the San Nicolas, you know, polymetallic, which is copper rich mine, I mean project, which is an open pit in Mexico. So those are the sort of things I would look at to see if, you know, that sort of stuff gets permitted. And whether anybody outside comes in, does somebody like Agnico that, you know, that comes in and does a $500 million acquisition of a 50-50 joint venture in San Nicolas like they did several years ago, would they do that again? Does that somebody else come into Mexico? That would be what I'd be watching in some of these places. But also in terms of funding the juniors, I was at a conference in Toronto several weeks ago where the pear tree guys were there and they do a lot of the the flow through shares and the charity flow through and they were sort of hinting at if the current you know the was an absolute the the minimum tax rules come in that would have a negative impact on flow through going forward it could reduce some uh, aspects of flow through by a third so so that won't be very good for some of these juniors uh, with assets in Canada. Yeah, no kidding. Who knows what's going to happen here, Joe, but a very interesting market. I guess just another broad question is, where are you seeing some of the best opportunities in these equities, whether it's metal focused, whether it's stage focused, whether it's jurisdictional focused? A lot of these stocks, I think, have revalued to a certain extent, but you take a look at longer term charts and A lot of them are still very far off of their highs, especially if you're looking at some of the smaller names, some of the larger names, those are at all time highs. So where are you seeing some of the best opportunities or are you seeing opportunities right now? Well, I would say like in terms of uh, if we go to critical minerals, I would still say that if you could find a critical mineral project in a good jurisdiction that's on the lower half of the cost curve and can beat like if it was nickel beat Indonesia in terms of costs. I know the ESG stuff that people were talking about has less impact nowadays on whether a a project gets built or funded, you know, though it's constantly hyped. And and on the, on the, and that goes the same for copper. Look for those kind of projects. They'll get built because uh, the supply side still is an issue for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these critical minerals. And on the gold side, again, it's got to be cost curve. You got to be on the lower part of the cost curve, and then it's got to be a permittable project. That's what's going to get taken out. If the project, you know, is on the lower part of the cost curve, but has water issues or, you know, uh, you know, it needs too much upfront capital, 
it'll be harder to build. And so it'll be a harder project to take out. I mean, you know, we could just use an example as B2 Goals acquisition of Sabina for the Back River project and how much more capital they've had to spend and how much more delays they've had versus their, I mean, even though the acquisition looked, you know, cheap, they've probably more than made up for it with the additional capital they put into that project and the delays. All right, Joe Mazumdar, editor of Exploration Insights. Always interesting to hear your insights in the resource sector, Joe. And boy, oh boy, we're going to have a lot to talk about now that we have at least a little bit more clarity on U.S. politics and now what President Trump is going to do and how that will impact metals and the underlying equities. Joe, as always, thank you for your time. Thanks for joining us on this weekend show. Great. Thanks, guys. Al Corlin's firm, A.B. Corlin and Associates Incorporated, provides consulting services to public companies on matters of regulatory compliance. To find out more, follow the link from www.kereport.com. The Corlin Economics Report will be back after this brief timeout. Second half of the weekend edition of the KE Report. We are now chatting with Matt Geiger, managing partner at MJG Capital. Going to continue to focus on the resource sector, a little bit less on maybe what the election fallout could be, as we covered a lot of that with Joe Mazumdar in the first half of the show. Now it's more into some of the companies, some of the individual sectors within the resource stocks that we can get Matt's opinion on how he sees this market playing out. So Matt, let, let's start off with the junior market. Look, we have heard that length, that nauseum really, just how much these juniors have continued to struggle in the face of a breakout in the gold price and consistent all-time highs in gold and even silver breaking out. We were seeing a lot of the juniors do a lot better in early October. I noticed a lot of juniors moving without even issuing any news releases. It was an interesting environment, but back half of October and even early November, those juniors started to fall back. Now, the debate being when the juniors run, that could be late cycle behavior, but they could also just be so undervalued that there could be a very impressive catch-up trade available. Uh, Matt, what's your takeaway from the junior market right now? Again, it ran in early October, has faded since. Good morning, gentlemen. Good to, good to be joining you. And I think, Corey, I think you characterized that very well. I mean, what, what we've seen this year, especially amongst the precious metal-focused juniors, is a lot of frustration. Gold price, silver price has done phenomenally uh, year to date. And so this move was led by the metal prices we started to see some of the major miners see some positive price action starting in the, the spring. And that's largely continued after a little breather over, over the summer. But I should note, we're still not seeing the leverage that one would expect to see by the major, major miners. They're maybe keeping track with the price of gold. Some of the better performing ones are doing better. But as a group, we're not seeing that 2 to 3x leverage that one would expect. But they are moving and they have been for six months. But the juniors have been left in the dust for the vast majority of the year. I will say this did start to change, I think, quite acutely. I would say around the third week of September, if you look at the chart of the TSXV, you could maybe say, you know, second week of September, we started to see it in the MJG portfolio, at least in, in the latter half of September. And then this really kicked into high gear for the first three weeks of October. And in fact, if we talked on the third in the third week of October, I would have told you that we were on pace for potentially our very best month of performance going all the way back to December of 2020. We were up 34% in de December 2020. I'm not saying we were up that, you know, in, in the third week of October. We were certainly up double digits on the month within the MJG portfolio. But to be frank, and you noted this, the past 10 to 11 trading days have been nothing short of brutal, you know, with pretty sharp pullbacks across a number of our larger and higher conviction positions within the MJG portfolio. This really started... The day of the uh, Newmont earnings miss, that was Thursday, October 24th, if I'm remembering correctly. So just two, two weeks ago. And then yesterday, the first trading day after Trump's reelection as U.S. president, was really insult to injury with commodity prices and, and resource equities 
really the only risk on asset class that seemed to react poorly to, to Trump's reelection. Now, again, that is a one day knee jerk reaction. But, you know, the question becomes, have we seen a change in trend, which, again, we had a really strong six six week period there for the juniors. Has this changed or are we simply taking a breather? And as it stands, and I'm, I'm willing to change my mind, but for now, I'm in the breather camp. The bellwether metals, gold and copper pricing continues to remain strong. Copper, notably, this is Thursday, November 7th, when we're speaking, is up 4%, over 4% on the day, bringing it back into that very healthy, you know, 440, 450 per pound uh, range. And then looking at the TSXV, and I don't want to put too much significance on, on technical analysis, because that's not the way that, that I drive investment decisions for the MJG partnership. But we remain well north of the you know, psychologically significant 600 level on the TSXV and also well above the moving averages, you know, 200 day moving aver- averages around 580 on the TSXV that really signaled that this breakout was occurring. So for now, I remain optimistic, you know, quite optimistic, actually, that we're in the early stages of a strong move across the resource juniors. And as noted, there's a lot of catch up to be played because it's been, you know, it was really nine months of of neglect when a lot of the metal complex, particularly precious metal focused equities, the larger names were, were performing quite well. Well, Matt, just kind of building on that answer you just gave, you know, when you think about prior cycles, especially the 1970s or the 2001 through 2011 cycle, the mining stocks had really over a decade to kind of stretch their legs. And it sometimes wasn't until the very end of the move the last year or two that we really saw that huge outperformance. Is it possible that things are playing out in a more structured way for a longer term gain here in the precious metal sector and even in the critical mineral stocks? Because I think people are kind of shocked from what we saw in 2020, the pandemic crash and and V-shaped response, and same thing with that 2016 short-lived response. Is this maybe a healthier bull market, I guess, is what I'm asking, because the majors are starting to move. We have seen the royalty companies move. And as the mid-tiers and the developers have started moving, maybe it's just going to take more time to filter down, like you're saying. Maybe it's just a breather. But could this extend out longer than the last two blips we've seen for just those very reasons? Yeah, I, th- I think you hit the nail on the head. That, that's at least the glass half full perspective. I guess one could argue that the junior market is irreparably broken and we won't see significant performance regardless of metal prices and the performance of the larger producers. I do not think that is the case, but you know we can remain open to that possibility. But I would argue this cycle is playing out more like it's supposed to, at least in a longer, more drawn out and powerful move. You mentioned 2016 and 2020, Super exciting periods, you know, particularly amongst the precious metal focused names. But those ended up largely being flashes in the pan. And we saw the gold price, the major producers and the juniors really in both of those uh, cases run in tandem. And it was exciting six, nine month periods in both of those cases. But then there were hangovers in 2021 amongst the precious metal names and in 2017 as well. So I think the glass half full perspective is that this is a more healthy traditional move that could signal a a longer and and more powerful move. And I I should also say, I mean, the gold price has come so much in the past nine to 12 months. I mean, we're up 40 percent year to date, which is wild. Gold is not supposed to move that much in in U.S. dollar terms in in a single year. So I think it'd be very healthy for the gold price to consolidate around its current levels for three, six, even nine months. I wouldn't mind that at all. And, you know, if past is prologue, we could see some of this excitement around the uh, precious metal pricing and, and equities trickle in elsewhere into the, the broader metals complex. That's certainly what happened uh, after the 2020 move, you know, 2021 and at least the first half of 2022 was the you know, year and a half of outperformance amongst the battery metal names and also just the broader industrial metals complex. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that play out at all. And that, of course, would suit the MJG portfolio just fine. We have plenty of precious metal exposure at around 35% of the portfolio, but the rest of that portfolio is split between copper, uh, ag minerals, and then some other battery battery metals. Yeah, well, in all fairness, Matt, this is one of the longer bull markets that we've even seen in GDX outside of that 2019 through 2020 run. But there was that big drop of COVID in the middle of that too. This has been one of the more sustainable uptrends for the stocks. 
We'll see if that glass half full narrative does play out and this continues. When you're looking at juniors then, let's say people are sitting on the sidelines or looking to rotate some money. What sort of juniors do you see as the best opportunity to take advantage of that potential of that junior catch-up trade? Well, you can probably imagine what my answer is going to be, and I'll, I'll stick to basics. I don't think you have to get too cute here as an investor. Focus on the people first and foremost. Is it a team that you trust and has made money for either you or close members of your network previously? Are they well incentivized, qualified for the task at hand, and focused exclusively at the task at hand? I think you have to ask all of those questions before you even consider getting the next phase of your analysis. Then look at the project that they're working on. I mean, my modus operandi has always been to focus on projects, at least those that are in the development stage, that I think have a chance of being either brought into production or bought out by a bigger player at spot metal prices. I like projects that don't need $4,000 gold or you know $6 copper in order to make sense on paper. I want projects that where the numbers look good, you know, at 450 copper or, or you know, 20, 25, $2,300 gold. And if metal prices continue to run in our favor, then great. That's icing on the cake. I mean, another very key point I'd emphasize, especially for some of the earlier stage juniors, is be really careful and, and make sure that they have sufficient working capital to achieve at least one significant catalyst, if not multiple catalysts, before, before considering buying on the open market. And, you know, if you have the ability to participate in private placements and you identify a name that checks all the boxes but needs to raise in the next three or six months and doesn't have a, a big drill program that they complete in the meantime, doesn't have a big economic study or a maiden resource coming out where you could see a significant share price rating, be patient. Um, put a little bit of money aside, sit on your hands, and then evaluate the, the placement when it's announced. And you know, for listeners that don't have the ability to participate in private placements, maybe it's best for them to look for juniors that have sufficient working capital to go 12 or 24 months or stick to some of the bigger names where there's no need to raise capital. And I think is just sticking with the royalty names can be a smart strategy for those that don't have the ability to kind of participate and evaluate private placements properly. So I would focus on all those points. Well, Matt, another area we'd like to discuss in the junior mining stocks is, do you think it's significant in a Trump administration where he's mentioned rolling back regulation in his prior term and, and, and this term as well and cutting out the red tape? Could this help on the permitting front? Should U.S.-based companies or companies operating in the U.S get a premium now because of the potentially better conditions for permitting? Maybe. I mean, there, there are certainly pros and some cons, actually, for the metals sector or U.S.-based mining companies due to a Trump administration, certainly a net positive. But I'd say on the positive front, looking at hot button projects like the you know Arctic and Bornite deposits up in the Ambler Mining District in north central Alaska, that's a JV split between Trilogy Metals and the much, much larger South 32. I mean, just look at the Trilogy share price. It's a day and a half since the election results uh, became known and Trilogy is up over 80 percent as of when I last checked. Another hot button you know, project that could benefit is uh, BHP and Rio's resolution project in Arizona. Th though, to be fair, they've been trying to push that forward for you know 25 years at this point. And we didn't see a significant amount of progress made in Trump's initial four years. But for the hot button and more controversial later stage development projects, Trump's win is absolutely a plus. You know, I do anticipate quicker turnarounds on the permitting front uh, as well. I would argue things didn't grind to a stop during the Biden administration. And it's really the first time that we've seen a Democratic administration, I would argue almost uh, any administration put such an emphasis on, on critical minerals. So there was still progress over the past four years. But I have heard anecdotally from the CEOs of a couple MJG holdings that the response times, for example, on drill permits, you know, whether those are plans of operation or categorical exclusions from you know, government agencies such as the BLM or the, the USFS, the Forest Service, they've noticeably slowed over the past few years in terms of response time. So I do anticipate we'll see an improvement there, though we might be looking 12 months down the line before that starts to, to kick in. And also, you know, just from a plain sentiment perspective, which I don't want to overlook the potential significance of, Trump is viewed as pro-resource uh, extraction, whether that's oil or gas or mining. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. And I think particularly for non-US-based mining investors, that have been considering U.S.-based mining investments, but
but have been turned off, I would argue a little bit unfairly, by the Biden administration and their policies may view this as an opportunity to to, to rush into the, the space. So I, I don't want to overlook just the, the, the pure sentiment aspect of this. But I'd say quickly there are a couple cons as well. The first is that there were a spate of articles over, over the summer talking about loans from the Department of Energy's loan program office, which has provided over $25 billion worth of loans to a couple dozen critical mineral projects. To be fair, most of these have been mineral processing, so not directly related to mining projects, though we have seen big loans announced for Lithium America's Thacker Pass and Ioneer's Rhyolite Ridge, you know, both lithium projects in Nevada. And, you know, Project 2025 calls for the complete abolishment of the loans program office. I think it's likely Trump will follow through on that, though we won't have a good sense for at least another 90 days, maybe six months on whether that's the case. So some of this loan support that we've seen from the federal government could disappear pretty quickly for critical mineral projects. And then I'd also say one point that I haven't heard spoken about too much yet, but I think it's worth flagging, is the potential effects if Trump does institute quote unquote, across the board tariffs, and he's been a little bit haphazard, I've heard him say 10 or 20%. But if he does implement across the board tariffs, the effect on capital costs of development stage projects, particularly later stage development projects that actually have a chance of being built within the next four years. And if he does follow through on these across the board tariffs, we could legitimately see the you know estimates and recent feasibility or pre-feasibility studies jump 10 or 20%. So I think that's worth keeping an eye on. I, I would note from an MJG perspective, we're pretty insulated from this because at least in terms of our U.S. exposure, it's from earlier stage explorers and prospect generators. So fortunately, that's not a huge concern for the MJG portfolio itself, but it's something that I would keep in mind if you're looking at later stage development projects with projects based in the U.S. Very interesting comments there, Matt. And it's a question that I've had for some of our other guests is, what will the changes in cost of capital be for these companies? We don't know, but you outline a good point there if these tariffs are put in place on the more aggressive side. Let's circle back around to that investor sentiment standpoint, because look, Trump is viewed as being pro-business. So he should be good for a number of sectors and a number of different businesses. Does that distract investors from coming into the resource sector then? <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a fair point. Uh, I mean, his election has been characterized by money flooding into cryptos in particular, with the view that he is going to be a pro-crypto, anti-regulation president on that front, and also just into the broader U.S. indices. Again, I, I don't want to draw any broad conclusions less than two, to, two trading days out from the election taking place, but we have seen the U.S. dollar you know, take a pretty uh, substantial move higher on the back of this money flowing in, into the United States you know, fi financial assets. But it does, and we'll see how it plays out. I don't want to make any firm prognostications on this front, but it does feel like some of the last gaps of what's already been a very strong move in, in U.S. equities in particular, really since the, the Fed rate hike tantrum in mid-2022. So I don't want to read too much into the you know, immediate aftermath of financial market behavior from his election. But your point is fair. There are other places for money to flow into. And, you know, potentially for a few months here, we'll see money flow into what's been, you know, particularly working in the past 12 or 24 months. And that would be cryptos, high priced tech stocks and kind of the U.S. markets more generally relative to the rest of the world. But I feel very confident if you're looking out three, four, five years, you are going to see the pendulum swing from the U.S. markets to the rest of the world, particularly emerging markets. I think you flow, see the pendulum swing from passive investing strategies towards active investing strategies. I think you see the pendulum uh, swing from growth <laughs> and speculation uh, towards value. So that my belief hasn't changed on that front, but it's very hard to say what's going to happen in the immediate term. Yeah, it's always hard to know what's going to happen in the short term blips, but appreciate you outlining some of the medium to longer term uh, trends that you think are going to play out in the markets. Let's just pivot back into the junior mining stocks one more time here, Matt, and talk about the M&A cycle. We were talking about this a little bit off mic before the call. You know, I mentioned that I had written an article in June that we'd already had 14 M&A deals. And then you had mentioned that, you know, the things had escalated a little bit in the middle of this year. And even recently, we've seen a couple of deals just announced in the last couple of weeks, Next Gold and Signal Gold merging, Minera Alamos taking over Sabre Gold, Aura Minerals moving in on Bluestone in Guatemala. 
so we've seen some M and A continue to accelerate. How are you looking at the M and A cycle? Where are we at in this M and A cycle? I think you could argue we're in the strongest window of M and A here within the mining space in in over a decade. It's been a flurry of activity, and like you said, it didn't come out of the blue. It was a very strong first half of the year, um, but I think it really accelerated starting with the Philo tie up with BHP and Lundin. That was late July, 4.1 billion Canadian there. Followed shortly thereafter by Goldfields making its new move for a Cisco mining. That was 2.1 billion. That was in mid August. First Majestics tie up with Gato Silver in early September, just before the the Beaver Creek conference in Colorado. You know, during the week of the conference, Anglo Gold making its move for sentiment, 3.4 billion right there. Since we last talked, I believe we talked late September, early October, we've seen Core take over Silvercrest. That's another 2.4 billion there. And then the granddaddy of them all, Rio Tinto making its move for Arcadium. That's $9.2 billion. So just those six deals right there, four of them precious metal focused, one of them copper focused, one of them lithium focused, $22.5 billion in total deal value. That is significant in what's you know just over a 90-day period there. And then, of course, as you mentioned, there's been a few smaller deals that maybe haven't grabbed the headlines, but are significant in its own right. You mentioned Aura Minerals, uh, agreeing to take Cerro Blanco off of Bluestone's hands. That's just over $100 million in total deal value. Though I, I should note that Bluestone shareholders are uh, receiving a little less than 60% of that figure up front, uh, with the remaining 40% of stated value in CBRs that only pay if Cerro Blanco achieves commercial production. So for that deal, to me, it feels like capitulation by the Lundin backed Bluestone team who I think want to move on to bigger and better things, frankly. And meanwhile, you have Aura, which prides itself in its you know, ESG, you know, CSR approach. They've had some success recently with some of the projects that they brought into production, taking a bit of a flyer on Cerro Blanco, which on paper could be a tremendously profitable asset, uh, particularly at current precious metal prices, but has been plagued by you know, opposition from local communities both in Guatemala as well as in El Salvador, right across the border, with concerns about arsenic or other chemicals being you know, released into local waterways. So that's a long-term process there. And I, I wish the Ara Minerals team the best in, in figuring out that situation. And that second deal you mentioned, which is directly you know, relevant to the MJG partnership, is Minera Alamos' takeover of Sabergold. And it's past producing Copperstone Mine in southwestern Arizona, uh, that was only a $30 million deal. I do think it makes sense for both parties. From Sabre's perspective, the company's really been saddled with an ugly balance sheet for a number of years now. Their debt outstanding was close to its stated market cap at the time that the deal was announced. And at least as it stands, you know, Sabre shareholders from the day before the deal was, was announced are you know, receiving close to a 75% premium on their shares where the, the creditors are receiving you know, their money back in the process. So it, it makes sense for Sabre. And then from Minera Alamos's uh, perspective, it was an uh, opportunistic move and what was a, a pretty distressed company. And uh, Minera Alamos is increasing its gold inventory by over a third, whereas they're only diluting shareholders, their share count by 14, 15% as it stands. They're diversifying their risk outside of Mexico, but to a jurisdiction that's not around the world from Mexico, you know, relatively easy access between their operations now in Arizona and their existing operations in Mexico, and also hedging against uh, permitting risk at their Cerro de Oro asset, which was before this deal number two in line to come into production after Santana. I think Copperstone will likely um, skip the line and become the second producing asset for Minera Alamos. Though as it stands, management is saying that they plan to uh, develop those assets jointly. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see if they're able to, to do that. But directly relevant to the MJG partnership because we own Star Royalties. And that's a company that I've written about probably in the past five or six MJG investor letters. It's a large position of ours. And they own a 4% life of mine stream covering the Copperstone asset. Um, so that was a really significant development for Star, which which saw its share price re-rate on the back of the deal because we have a credible team coming in with access to capital and mine building experience, stating that they're going to take Copperstone into production as soon as late 2025. I'd love for that to be right. I think that sounds a little optimistic, maybe you know 
early to, to spring 2026 is more realistic, but there's now a clear path to production for Copperstone and you know cash flow coming in the near future from Star's 4% life of mine stream. So that was an exciting deal. And then I think you mentioned Next Gold and Signal merging as well. That was in early October, I believe. So not as fresh off the press uh, as either the Aura Bluestone or the Sabre Minera Alamos deal. But what we see there in, in short is a Frank Justra backed roll-up vehicle uh, coming together here. You know, they're coupling two late stage development projects, Next Gold with its Goliath project in Northern Ontario, Signal with its Goldboro uh, project in Nova Scotia. You know, no immediately clear operational synergies there from what I can tell, but the deal is being marketed as making sense because both projects are expecting to see a completion of permitting in 2025. And Next Goal, of course, also has its NIBLAC project in Alaska, which is not nearly as advanced. That came from a merger with uh, Rob McLeod's Black Wolf Copper and Girl Gold earlier this year when Next Gold was named Treasury Metals and then rebranded as, as Next Gold there. So it looks like a royal, royalty, or sorry, a, um, a roll up vehicle in motion. And it'll be interesting to see if that's it for Next Gold or another one or two, you know, single asset juniors find its way into that vehicle in the foreseeable future. Matt, have we seen this environment before where we're seeing a lot of these juniors, some of which aren't even in production, start to take on these other assets still with that overhang of you need to get it built? Other ones are producing, but do they have the cash flow to build other mines within their pipeline if they are bigger projects? What do you take away from this environment and what kind of deals do you like being seen done when it comes to that blend of development versus already in production assets. Yeah, well, all else equal, I like to see less juniors on the board. <laughs> we are overwhelmed with juniors. There's probably 3,000, at, at the very least 2,500 public listed juniors across the TSXV, the ASX, and then other assorted stock exchanges around the world. So from my perspective, the less, the better. <laughs> there's there's less homes for capital. There's more likelihood that capital flows into the vehicles that, that you own. None of these deals are perfect. You know, Aura, to my understanding, doesn't have any Guatemala exposure, so that will be a new jurisdiction for them. In the case of Monero Alamos, you know, they're known as open pit heap leach experts, and Copperstone is an underground uh, mine, though Doug Ramshaw was, you know, very quick to point out that they have significant underground experience within that team as well. And in the case of Next Gold and, and Signal Gold, there's not immediate synergies between those two assets, you know, from a jurisdiction perspective. But their argument would be they're of similar stages and come, could be coming online with similar similar timing. So I wouldn't say any of these deals are, you know, picture perfect. But I take the broader sense that more assets under one roof is better. You know, each of these companies' cost of capital will likely decrease as a result of getting bigger. And I think from a broader, it's good for the space to see less names on the board. Well, Matt, another piece of news that dropped just recently that I think you have some thoughts on is Ridgeline Minerals traded on the TSXV under the ticker RDG. They just put out some news and we heard from the CEO, we'll be bringing them on the show soon as well. Nevada Gold Mines, their partner in Nevada, has drilled a Carlin type gold hit at their SWIFT project, hit some higher grade. This The company feels this is very significant and you felt the same way. So maybe weigh in on this particular drill result and why you think it's important for Ridgeline Minerals. Yes, I do think it's significant, and I, but I should note I'm biased here. We have been Ridgeline Minerals shareholders since the September 2022 private placement. And it's also the most recent featured investment that I included in the July 2024 MJG partnership letter. So it's a full 12 page write up on Ridgeline. But this is a team executing a business model that I have tremendous confidence in. But to turn to the news, as a little context, this SWIFT project is located just seven kilometers and on trend from Nevada Gold Mine's world class, class Cortez complex. And, you know, last I checked, Cortez hosted, you know, 25 million ounces of gold with an average grade of roughly five grams per ton gold. So this is truly a world class operation. And SWIFT is just a short drive away. Nevada Gold Mines, in turn, is earning into SWIFT. It's still 100% owned by Ridgeline, but NGM is earning into SWIFT with an agreement to spend US 30 million for up to a 70% stake in the project. In terms of this morning's news release, it provided assays from the first hole of the 2024 drill program. And this was highlighted by an intercept of 
1.1 meters at 10.4 grams per ton gold, uh, starting at 700, 676 meters downhole. This is the sixth hole drilled by NGM at the project um, since they came into the fold a couple years ago. And while the intercept is narrow, there's, there's no question about that, this is highly significant. Ridgeline and NGM already knew that there was a significant gold system at Swift with the right host rocks as well, the Roberts Mountain Formation. But in historic drilling and recent drilling from NGM, we've seen 51 meters at you know, 0.19 grams per ton gold, 37 meters at 0.3 grams per ton gold, 49 meters of 0.45 grams per ton gold. So these are certainly significant widths and highly anomalous grades from the drilling that we've seen to date. However, not nearly the grade that is necessary uh, to be economic at six or 700 meter depth, that's clear. So the question up until this announcement this morning, we know there's gold here, we know there's the right host rocks, but do we have grades? Does this project exhibit grades that could be remotely feasible um, at these depths? And I think the answer uh, after this morning is a resounding yes. We've seen grades that are two orders of magnitude higher than anything that was intercepted previously uh, at the project and grades that if there is enough tonnage of this material would be economic at these depths. Whereas if you're talking 0.5 grams per ton material, there's no length of intercept that would make that work at six or 700 meters depth. 10 grams per ton of gold, there, there certainly is. So it's now a question of, of putting the pieces together. Barrick has to spend another US 11 and a half million between now and the end of 2026. So in roughly the next 24 months, or this project goes back to Ridgeline on a 100% basis. So I, I have heard that Barrick will be highlighting this intercept in their Q3 MDNA, um, which is coming out this afternoon. So it should already be uh, publicly um, announced by the time that this interview is posted. And I, I should note that's significant. They've already drilled five holes at Swift and they haven't discussed any of them in their, in their previous disclosures. So this is the first hole that they'll be flagging to their shareholders w within their Q3 MDNA. And it says to me that they're very excited with what they're seeing. And it's a foregone conclusion, in my opinion, that they will ultimately get their 60% stake. So that means spending on average, US 6 million over the next two years to complete this first stage of the earn-in. So I would argue this is excellent news for Ridgeline shareholders. We've seen a little bit of a share price reaction. Yes, it's not a 100 gram meter hit that's you know splashing across people's news wires as we speak. But I think if you understand the context of the story and get a sense of, of Barrick's excitement, it gives you a good sense of, of where this is heading. And I should note, it, it really opens the door for the potential for four different Ridgeline projects to be drilled next year. I think it's a foregone conclusion that we'll see a significant program at Swift. Also has an agreement at Ridgeline's Black Ridge project where there's a earn in milestone late next year. So there'll likely be a program there. I think we'll likely see the first drilling at Salina funded by South 32. That, that agreement was announced earlier this year. And then Chad Peters, Ridgeline CEO, has been very clear that the company uh, plans to drill their 100% owned Big Blue project on a 100% on a basis as well. So I think great news from a SWIFT perspective and further confidence that next year is going to be a huge year from a news flow perspective for, for Ridgeline shareholders. Thanks for breaking that down, Matt. And one other point, I guess, to make is this still does seem fairly early on in that drill program where Ridgeline needs Nevada gold mines to drill this asset because these are very deep holes. They cost a lot to drill. And look, even if they do earn into that 60% interest, how do you go about attributing different value to Ridgeline Minerals? Then the company sits at a $17 million market cap. Yes, they're not going to be spending any money on that asset, at least right now, while Nevada Gold Mines earns into their position. But with all the other drilling that they would like to do, how do you go about giving a value proposition around this company with so much potentially going on? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's not easy to do. You know, from a back of the envelope perspective, kind of the brain dead way to go about it, say, oh, well, NGM is spending $30 million to earn a 70% stake. And therefore, you know, the remaining 
30% stake is you know worth 12 or 13 million US and, and calling it a day at that. Of course, that doesn't factor in the chance that NGM does not go through with the deal. And it also doesn't factor in the time value of money because NGM has you know a couple of years before they need to hit that first milestone payment and then a couple of years beyond that to hit that, that second milestone spend commitment. The way I look at it for a company like Ridgeline, which I would argue is a hybrid prospect generator, and, and this is hard to do for, for your average investor that's not following these companies as closely, but within MJG, we have a proprietary prospect generation business model where I'm tracking 40 prospect generators, primarily in North America, but also a few in Australia. And each year we canvass them and adjust these numbers as the years go on for what their expected partner spend is over the coming 12 months. So that's actually, I think, the best way to look at it. Because sure, you can have a huge deal. Rio Tinto comes in and you know, agrees to spend $75 million for a 75% you know, stake in said project. But if they have 10 years to do that, you might not see spend in until year six, seven, eight, or nine, if you see that spend at all. And so it really doesn't factor in that time value of money. And I think money going into the ground, you know, in the next 12 months is far better than money potentially going into the ground four years out. So for each of these companies, I look at how much they're expecting their partners to put into the ground over the next 12 months. I, I deem that uh, synthetic revenue is what I would call that. And then I look at the company's enterprise value relative to synthetic revenue. And if you look at all 40 prospect generators, as it stands, your average prospect generator is getting about $3 per enterprise value or $3 in value per $1 of partner spend. Now that can fluctuate. And I think if this bull market continues, we'll see you know, that, that increase maybe to f- increase further. But as it stands, if you have a company that's expecting a prospect generator that's expecting to see 10 million put in the ground by its partners hypothetically, on average, their enterprise value is roughly 30 million. And so I look at these from a relative perspective from about in terms of looking at valuation. So I needed to check the box of the people, the assets, the quality of the partners, the company's financial structure. And then if I'm looking at whether the valuation's fair or undervalued, I'll compare how much they're expecting to go into the ground relative to their enterprise value and how that looks against peers. So it takes that takes a lot of research, but I think that's the best way to kind of ascertain whether these prospect generators are undervalued, fairly valued, or overvalued. Very interesting. All right, there you have it. Wrapping up the weekend edition of the KE Report with Matt Geiger, managing partner at MJG Capital. I hope you all enjoyed this weekend show. Please go back through our website, kereport.com. And podcast, search the KE Report in your podcast player to listen to all our daily editorials, many of which where we covered the market moves on the back of the election and a lot of company updates again this week. As always, you can keep in touch with Shad and I through email, and we hope to all see you down at that New Orleans Investment Conference happening November 20th through 23rd. Everyone, thanks for tuning in to this weekend show. Matt, thank you very much for your time. The Corlin Economics Report is produced for A.B. Corlin and Associates. Opinions expressed on this program are intended solely for the entertainment of our listeners, do not constitute investment advice, and are not necessarily those of this network, radio station, or our sponsors. Find out more about this program and today's guests by visiting www.kereport.com. For Al Corlin, this is Colleen Robbins. Join us again next week for the Corlin Economics Report.